This tutorial will give you a look at how land use code or other sets of textual rules can be interpreted and turned into algorithmic code. For this tutorial, we won't be constructing a definition from scratch. Instead, we'll look in detail at the workings of an existing definition. So go ahead and open the file called site model in the folder of uh, source data accompanying this tutorial uh, and open this file parametric massing.gh. Uh, I'm just going to drag and drop it onto this grasshopper window so we can see it. Um, so this is kind of a big definition, so rather than trying to create it from scratch with you, I'm just going to walk you through what it's doing and how it functions. Um, and we're going to do that kind of step by step, and feel free to follow along and dissect it in greater detail. But the idea here is that essentially we've got two parcels here, um, and we want to visualize the kind of allowable massing on this site according to a series of rules. And you can see that we can do it for two, but we could just as easily with a more you know, complex parcel network, we could easily calculate this all at once as a means of visualizing you know, the implications of a series of rules on a kind of urban configuration. So this is drawn incidentally from a uh, a real project that I worked on where we were uh, we were developing a project for a client and wanted to visualize all of the possible compliant massings uh, that could be created in this uh, in this site. So uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to use uh, this component, the dynamic pipeline, which I showed before in order to grab these purple curves on the site boundaries layer. And I'm gonna turn on only draw preview geometry for selected objects so that we can kind of see as we flip through everything that I'm selecting. I wanna make sure that these have consistent orientation. So this is another trick that I've shown where if you flip a closed curve with a circle as a guide curve, you can make sure that everything is oriented the same. And we have a couple rules here that we wanna apply. Uh, for each portion of a structure above 85 feet in height along a designated green street, an additional setback is required at a rate of one, put, one foot for, of setback for every five feet if the height of such portion exceeds 85 feet. So that's basically verbatim taken from land use code in Seattle, but I think there are rules like this in many different municipalities. Um, there's a similar rule over here, which may maybe a little simpler. We'll start with this one. For each portion of a structure above 65 feet in height along the street, a setback of 20 feet is required above 65 feet. So we have some curves in the model which represent a street and, whoops, and a green street over here. And those live on their own layers in Rhino. I've got a green street layer and a streets layer. And so... I want to find the edges of these parcels which are adjacent to these street conditions. So I'm going to start by just exploding these curves and then evaluating each one of their edges uh, at 0.5 as a way of getting a midpoint. This is reparameterized, so I know that that 0.5 will live there. And then I'm using uh, the dynamic pipeline to retrieve the driving geometry, the streets. Uh, which we have here, and using curve closest point to find the points that are closest on the street uh, from each one of these kind of parcel edge centers. And rather than using the points, I'm using the distance and testing whether it's smaller than the value 47. This should seem very familiar relative to some of the prior tutorials. And I'm extracting just those edges of each parcel that are adjacent to a street. With that, we can extend those curves a little bit, and this is sort of a safety measure. Um, I know that down the road we're gonna be performing a Boolean operation and I don't want it to exactly align at the edges, so I'm just expanding it ever so slightly by a value of 10. And then if we read this rule, it applies above 65 feet, and that setback needs to be taken above 65 feet, so we're gonna move it up by 65. And then we're going to offset every one of those curves by 20 and negative 20. I'm just taking this value and multiplying it by negative one and one to get a list of values by which to offset. And so this is gonna offset in both directions because you never really know which way a curve is oriented. I mean, you kind of do, but it's, I find it safest to offset in both directions. So there's, this is actually a gap of 40, but relative to its position on the lot line, it's 20 in both directions. 
We can then P shift that list because offset always adds a few new layers of hierarchy. We want to have a list of each pair of curves so that we can loft them together. So we wind up with these kind of planar surfaces right where the offset needs to be taken or the setback rather. And then we can just extrude them up by some large amount. And essentially these are going to be Boolean objects or, or um, closed poly surfaces that we can use to Boolean out of a kind of initial mass before we start kind of working on the floors and things like that. So that's going to be the approach we'll use to model step backs and setbacks is to kind of create a positive uh, volume that represents the kind of negative space of whatever the setback or step back needs to be. And we're going to do the same thing on this one, which rather than being a sort of straight step back, it is slanted. It goes back five feet uh, or it goes back uh, one foot for every five feet. So it's a slope of one in five above 85 feet. So most of this is actually exactly the same. We're retrieving our Green Street curve. We're retrieving the edge that's closest to it or that is within a threshold distance of it. We're moving it up this time by 85. And this time, instead of offsetting in two directions, lofting and extruding, like we did over here, offset, loft, extrude, what we're going to do is move that curve up by 500 feet and then offset it by negative 100 feet. So this is how we're getting our 1 and 5 ratio. So you can see that that curve, there's sort of our original curve and then our other one, and there's sort of a slant applied here. Um, and if we merge these two together and we have to do another p-shift after our offset in order to make sure that the data structures match we've got 0 0 1 0 0 1 so those will merge into lists of one or two um, the reason there's a one in there is because one of these didn't have any curves that were along a green street so this parcel doesn't have this rule applied um, but we want to preserve its data structure so that everything downstream kind of aligns with which parcel is which so when we create our loft, we get that kind of step back or setback plane, um, but we get nothing on this parcel. And then uh, we want to find the sort of normal of this surface. And actually, this should be like this. Uh, so we've got our surface. We want to find the normal direction, which should be pointing out. We don't know if it's pointing out this way or that way. I happen to know it points downwards. So we're taking that and multiplying it by a negative amplitude and then extruding that out into space. So this is going to be our second void, or our second sort of mass, which is going to represent something that needs to be kept clear for the setback. So we can merge both of those sort of sets of setback and stepback geometry. And then we need something to subtract from. So we're going to return back over here. Now. We may want to adjust the lot coverage. We may not want to cover the entire lot. So we can play with, you know, kind of manipulating this geometry. Um, and similarly, we probably actually want sliders for all of these. Uh, so let's, let's just do this. Uh, so with these surfaces, we can kind of control if something recedes from one side of the lot or not. And then we're going to take those base surfaces and extrude them up by some maximum height on site. You know, you could even go higher if you wanted. And then we're going to take those volumes and we have a list of two closed poly surfaces which correspond to our two original site boundaries. And because we've maintained our data tree all the way through, we have two branches here, which represent our sort of two sets of volumes that need to be booleaned out. So in order to get these lists to match up, we need to graft this list of values so that each one is on its own branch, which you can see there is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then we have the same branch structure over here, which means that this set of uh, the first set of volumes will be subtracted from the first extrusion and the second set from the second set. So now we have kind of a theorized like maximum building envelope and you can see that as I sort of adjust the range of this surface, uh, everything kind of updates accordingly. And now we want to apply a final rule here, which is an FAR rule, which says that the area of 
this building cannot exceed some multiple of the area of the lot. So first we need to retrieve the area of the lot, which we've got over here. So here's each parcel, here's its area, and then our max FAR, let's just say, is 19 for now. And so this is going to be a maximum total area that our building can achieve. And so we're going to use a little trick here. Um, we're going to assume that the area of this is greater than whatever that maximum is because we've built up, you know, all the way to maximum height or maybe even higher. And we're going to choose a floor to floor height of 12 feet. And we're going to contour these volumes to create floors and create boundary surfaces that span those uh, contours. And then we're going to P-shift again to get this back into our simple two branches that represents our two parcels. And then we're going to take the area of each one of those floors and then use a component that we maybe haven't seen yet called mass addition. Now, mass addition is typically used to create a sum. So we can see this is the total area. But it has a second output that's actually really useful in this case called progressive, progressive or partial results. So what this says is, all right, give me A, give me A plus B, give me A plus B plus C, give me A plus B plus C plus D, and so on. So the first value will always be the same as whatever the first value was in here, but it's sort of adding up as you go up. So by going up the building, we're kind of taking the, sum, the progressive sum area. So we basically want to say, okay, once this progressive sum exceeds what's allowable, delete all those other floors. So we're going to do a test which says if the progressive sum is greater than the area allowed by FAR, then extract those floors. So every place where it's not larger, we have a false value and we're getting results out of the B. Um, and everywhere it is uh, over than those floors we really can't build uh, because they're uh, they're just going to be they're going to cause us to exceed that allowable area. So this trims off floors up at the top, and we can then use an extrude component with a z vector tied in to our floor to floor height to get a kind of stacked representation of these volumes. So if we increased the allowable FAR. Uh, you know, maybe there's a transfer of air rights or something like that. We can see how that would affect the massing on the site. If we change the lot coverage, uh, we can also play with that. So if we cover more of the lot, we can't go as high. Um, and so this is a way to kind of explore the consequences of rules under different conditions. The last thing we do over here is finally, again, take the areas of each one of those floors, get each one of our per floor areas, and then use mass addition again to get a sum for the total area of each building. So this may seem daunting, but I hope it's clear that the actual complexity of the logic isn't that great. Um, and you can kind of string together series of rules uh, in order to create a, an algorithmic interpretation of whatever a sort of building code is, is saying or proposing.